Um, all right. Well, welcome everyone. Good, e good evening. Um, thank you for being here tonight for this event. My name is Alexandra. I'm a bookseller at Brookline Booksmith, which is normally located in Brookline, Massachusetts, but tonight we have come to you in your very own homes. Uh, if you're familiar with our store, welcome back. If this is the first time you're hearing about us, welcome. Uh, we're very happy to have all of you join our community this evening, and we uh, appreciate your support um, for not only us, but for these incredible authors and all the authors that we are able to host because we have uh, such a wonderful community and customer base. So thank you so much. Um, throughout this little book talk, the chat and question box are open, so please feel free to make use of those, talk to each other, say hello. Uh, but please also note that Brookline Booksmith has a strict policy against abusive behavior and language, and at our discretion, any attendee can be removed uh, from an event for partaking in such behavior. That being said, I know none of you would dream of doing such a thing, so um, I just say it because I have to, not because I don't have full faith in you. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go in kind of reverse order here, because um, I think that's the way you're showing up. You're showing up on, on my screen anyway. I've got Jed first and then Carrie. So, um, so to to the left for me anyway, <laughs> we have Jed Coffin, who is the author of the memoir A Chant to Soothe Wild Elephants, and teaches in the University of New Hampshire's MFA Creative Writing Program. He lives in Brunswick, New Hampshire, which is a lovely place, I think. Maine. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, Brunswick, Maine. Oh, it's Brunswick, Maine. I'm sorry. I actually didn't even know. I have family in New Hampshire. And we always go to Brunswick, I thought. Oh, okay. Oh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's my bad. Sorry. Both the universe, yeah. Uh, in Rough House Friday, uh, Coffin, a small town Vermont native who can't find his way, washes up in Alaska and finds himself through boxing. Through a fight that initially terrifies him, he begins to sort through the legacies of his upbringing, the rural child of white and Thai parents, and of a father whose sense of manhood alienates his son. Rough House Friday is a meditation on violence and abandonment, masculinity, and our inescapable longing for love. Um, and it's very good. So I'll drop a link to that if you don't have it already. Um, and then we are also joined today, of course, by Carrie Arsenault, who is a book critic an editor at Orion Magazine, a contributing editor at the Literary Hub, and a mentor for PEN America's Prison Justice Writing Program. Uh, Milltown is her first book. In Milltown, uh, we in uh, investigate the slow-moving catastrophe of Arsenault's hometown, Mexico, Maine, a paper mill town racked by economic decline and the community-wide collapse of environmental and physical health. Milltown is a moral wake-up call that asks whose lives are we willing to sacrifice for our own survival? So we've got two wonderful nonfiction books that are sort of similar in theme, but also very different. And I can't wait to um, hear the two of you sort of get into that and talk about the nitty gritty of it all. So without further ado, uh, it is a pleasure to have them with us tonight. And I am so happy to introduce Carrie Arsenault and Jed Coffin. Thank you. Yeah, clap. Everybody's clapping. For them. Everybody's Thanks clapping. For putting, thanks for putting us together, Brookline. I, we didn't even know each other until now. I that. Until yesterday yeah. or whenever that was. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Carrie, do you want to dig in a little bit, or what do you think? First, I have to. I, I do. She said something interesting. She said in her introduction, your book, and it might lead us there. But she said you washed up on the. Oh, <laughs> I, was, yeah. I know. She said she washed up on the shores of you know Alaska. Yeah. Like, yeah. wow, that's really befitting to sort of both of our our books, right? We were talking about water and how we both sort of washed up into our our sort of landscapes as it were yeah yeah and you also i know that you use the word or you you think about or scrutinize the word body of water and bodies in general and um it's so cool you know it's really neat to see your book coming out now and my book having been out for a year and change and to think it, it helps me see my book in a lot of different ways you know where um on first read it was about sort of what it's about on the surface and then now some time has passed and we've been able to chat a little bit and help me yeah. understand how to see my story through a few different lenses one of those being like ecological and and uh, river and water-based which is cool yeah i was um first of all for those of you who don't know his book well i'm not gonna um probably get it a little bit wrong but he did literally wash up and he like paddled how many hundreds of miles up the coast to oh, about um I uh, like depending on, you know, but as the crow fly, flies like 850, but it was probably about a thousand just with right. all the like weird cutoffs and stuff like that. Yeah, we have this um, water thing going on. Yeah. For, um, 
And for me, it was, I mean, obviously the mill, the river in our town, this is the actual shape of the river, which is quite beautiful um, and quite um, toxic as well. I guess I should, um, the, the river too is, I mean, it's a bit of a structure in your book because that's how you got there. But in mine too, is the, act, the actual structure of the book was the river. Um, I looked at, I, I, when I was doing research, I had just piles and piles and piles of documents coming from every which way, but loose, um, you know, milk crates and moldy documents and people mailing me things and emails and reports. And I was Googling everything and old newspapers and family history. It's like, oh my God, it was, and, and each time a document would end up on my door, I'd be like, what path am I gonna take now? What path am I gonna, you know what I mean? So like, um, sort of like you probably with the, there was one point in your journey too, you were kind of like pushed, like pushed along like the yeah. wrong path, right? Yeah. So anyway, yeah, that's, that's what was happening to me. And I was like, I could either, I could either go with this or I could just struggle to like paddle upstream, you know, like a salmon. And um, so I went with it and I tried to go down all those paths so I didn't miss anything. And um, um, so I used that river, our river as, as the basic structure of our book, really, um, you know, just the, the movement of it moving forward all the time, but, but going down these different tributaries. And rivers too, they give like, John, oh, sorry, they, go ahead, jump in. I wanted, I wanted to ask um, why, okay, so there's rivers in the abstract, which I think have like a storied symbolic power, you know, obviously in, in literature and stories, but what about, the actual Androscoggin River that I don't know if everybody listening yeah. knows much about that river. And what about when you said, when we talked a few days ago and you said the Androscoggin is actually the structure of my book. I, I was thinking um, about that river, which I paddled several times um, from kind of your, your neighborhood to mine and um, all the dams uh, and how those create certain landscapes and kinds of stories um the somewhat like the somewhat the simplicity of the androscoggin too it's kind of a straight shot from mexico to brunswick you know there's a couple little tributaries but you can it's just sort of a straight line not a straight line but it's a it's um a one-way street and a slow moving line I mean, slow moving yeah like rapid at that point yeah yeah so um so and uh, so I suppose different than the other big rivers in Maine. And I don't know, do you find yourself working through that at all? You know, I, I, in the same way that I had talked about how, you know, when I first realized that we were going to have a conversation, I thought, isn't that cool? Um, for my whole life, I lived at the other end of the river from you, you know, but it was the same water flowing past us in a way. So how did the Androscoggin in particular inform your idea of structure and riverness? Yeah, well, it, you know, besides the obvious metaphor, I think I even say it out loud in the book where John McPhee says something like, rivers are the basic metaphor of life. <laughs> like he says that, and I quote him, just in case somebody didn't really get the point, you know, it's like yeah. put a pin in it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, it does. I mean, that's true. It carries things and it, it gives life. It gets sick. It gets wrecked. It gets polluted. You know, and that's, that's like a, a bodies, two human bodies, which I think say in the prologue, but it's, these bodies, whether the water bodies or human bodies, I mean, and we think of them often separate, not belonging to the same landscape, but they really do. So that was one way. But the other way, the more progressive, the more narrative thrusting way was, I saw as I was collecting all this research and finding out of this information about the toxics that were piling up in, in our town, that the river was the perfect metaphor for that too, or, the perfect structure because it it carried things you know and it, it picked up things along the way it would get thrown in the river or whatever or fall in the river from the particulates from the mill and then get carried down river and, and collect things along the way until it got to your town <laughs> brunswick but but it wasn't just toxic it was just like the so the, the toxics and the literal things were collecting but also i was collecting these things also our bodies were collecting these things the you know dioxins which is the main sort of toxic i confront in this book which is is a byproduct of the paper bleaching process is a bioaccumulative um 
toxic, meaning the further the food chain, the further up the food chain it goes, the stronger it becomes. And it's a persistent chemical, a persistent toxic too. So it doesn't really go away very quickly. And as it's leaving our body, as the half-life, I think it's 11 years, as it's leaving the body, we're still collecting more. So it's like that, I feel like that's like a river too, do you know? It's like the, the water just keeps coming. It just keeps coming, it keeps collecting. And then it gets to your town, then it gets to the Atlantic Ocean eventually, where all that junk that it collected dumps out into the ocean where everybody else gets a little piece of it too. Because that's not untrue. I mean, we can even, the toxics that we create in our mill are not, um, they're not provincial, you know, nothing is. I mean, look at now, I don't know if anybody saw the map today of, of the wildfires, but a friend sent it to us and the smoke is covering the entire United States and it's halfway to Hawaii now. Yeah. Um, talk about toxics. Um, but anyway, I don't want to get off track, but but yeah, that's how I looked at the river in that way. Um, but it also, there's like a substructure too. Should I get into this? Is this yeah, too nerdy? Yeah, what I'm, is it really thinking down there in the chat? Let's see, is there anybody? No, okay. They're all mesmerized, right? They're Everyone's mesmerized by me. Like on the edge of the sea, I swear. Yeah, I can see them. I know, like, wait, we came here to listen about Milltown. Yeah. Um, no, the, there's a substructure too in this narrative that, you know, it's a series, and I think this, you are kind of doing this in a way, too, in your book, is I'm, I'm going home, and I'm leaving, and I'm going home, and I'm leaving that recursive movement. So as you're going forward, you're also doing this, you yeah. know, tumbling through, but moving. Um, I think that, um, you know, that going back and forth between home and away gave me new perspectives on on home or family or whatever it is i was looking for you know um the insider outsider thing you know when i'm home i can see things one way and when you're away you see things a different way you know um it also for me enunciated that, that i was both witnessing my town but i was also a participant because i wasn't in this book i'm not an active like outside journalist you know trying to like expose right. some criminal mastermind thing, <laughs> the criminal empire of the paper mill. Um, and also acts as that, that kind of back and forth acts, like I'm a critic and an advocate. I mean, I really, I love this town and I hate this town sometimes. I mean, often it's somewhere gray in between um, that I feel about it. I think about home. I don't know, I mean, I think you, you weren't necessarily writing about home, but you were struggling, I think, with that same thing a little bit, like maybe reckoning, reckoning with your past, right? Yeah, for sure. And I think what, um, what emerged out of, I feel like I'm writing an eighth grade book report where it's like compare and contrast, you know, your book was like mine in the following. No, but it's so fun. Like, yeah. I appreciate yeah. That. yeah, thank I'm you. I'm gonna pretend nobody's here and we can just talk about it. Yeah, thank you, Miss Dion. Um, so, uh, yeah, and you know, to me, it's one of the, you know, I'll go back to that thing that I wrote in our initial email exchange is when I said, you know, I, I kind of didn't want to do this in, in like a first round email, but I, I said, you know, um, the book spoke to me, your book spoke to me on so many levels, and, but it, the most fundamental and almost primal is that sense that we share a river. And um, as much as I think that I write about other places and other kinds of people and different worlds. Um, every story that I tell, I am a little concerned about this, in fact, like is ultimately an origin story, you know, it, yeah. tracing a, an experience or a moment of, um, or a cross section of my, a time in my life back to its source, you know, and, um, and if that's Umbagog or whatever, you know, whatever that source is to the Androscoggin, but I, and I said, you know, reading about your river, one of the most um, nonsensical stories that I have about that river is that as a kid, I go back and forth to Thailand a lot, to my mother's village. And there was a time when I really did believe that the little canal that ran through her village, that the Androscoggin that ran past your house and then mine was an extension of that, like it was the same river. And Great. what a beautiful conceit for a child to have, you know, that 
if the river's all connected, yeah. Yeah, but I think a lot of that had to do also with, um, because it was very brown at the time and yeah. polluted in the same way that the canal was polluted and um, sort of lifeless and it was very industrial. You know, the canals in Southeast Asia are used, um, you, you can fish them, but they're primarily for washing and moving stuff. And, um, yeah, right. I think the Androscoggin is still an industrial grade river. I'm pretty wow. sure. Yeah. Yeah. I know my nephews are fishing there now. And, um, and you're, I told them, I'm like, I think you can eat one fish a year. Mm -hmm. That's what they tell you. That's what they tell That's you. That's what they tell you, yeah. Yeah. Or zero. You can also eat zero. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's interesting you say that about the origin story because I mean, aren't all aren't all stories in some way or another? I mean, our origin stories because I mean, our landscapes define us. I don't care if you like your landscape or or anything, but our landscapes define us. You know, they do. Whether that means home or whether it means away, whatever that landscape, the bigger environment. So, I mean, I thought about that a lot. Is is how the landscape. It, like I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was writing a memoir about me necessarily, although it ended up being about mm. me in some ways, but it was a bigger project about just landscapes defining people. And then also how we define the landscape, you know, how we impose that paper mill upon the landscape. And then again, another recursive movement, what it does back to us, <laughs> you know, it's like coming back in more diabolical forms, you know, we're going to put this big, factory here on the riverbank and we're going to put all this shit in it and then what's going to happen is it's going to get back at us you know nature is coming back at us or whatever even yeah. though we're we're really the same thing it's it's like we're we're messing with our you know a body of river a body of water and a, bo a human body are the same we come from the same things and to mm -hmm. sort of mess with that is like messing with your own dna yeah yeah and that's why the river too the river looks like i mean on the cover even they designed it so beautifully it looks like a strand of dna you know yeah um, one of the things i loved about your book too is the way that you addressed how certain stories that we learn to tell about landscapes um both amplify and glorify our landscapes but we also allow us allow us to distance ourselves from um from the soul of those landscapes, you know, like I'm very aware that the way we talk about the Androscoggin is with a kind of like gritty affection, right? You know, like oh, it's so great. Like we all have our funny stories about how much it stank in the '80s, and right. like you know the um, oh, we used to get Androscoggin fever when we went swimming, and you know, and like all, and it's this like folksiness about it. Huh, but yeah. the reality is that it's that's very sad, you know, and um, it, those stories are more than just dark humor in some ways, right? They, um, they have done more damage. It's funny. Uh, I feel like somebody asked me this once, like, why? Like, I'm always smiling. <laughs> I'm always laughing about this, but I'm writing about these scary, terrible things. But I think humor in Maine is maybe underreported or something. Mm -hmm. I think that's a way we have to deal with the, some of this stuff. You know, at least those of us that aren't living in blueberry patches and you know taffy coastal towns and that kind of stuff i don't know humor seems like a way of sort of carrying on you know right, right. You, you just sometimes you have to do what you have to do right but that's also that that made me think something you just said made me think of something else we talked about was that whole myth about maine you know there's I was talking to Kurt Anderson last night about this. He says there's no other state that where there's such a differential between the per, 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 um, perception, sorry, <laughs> the perception of a state and some of the inner realities of the state. Yeah. You know, he's like, maybe Oregon. I'm like, yeah, but Oregon's not called vacation land, you know? <laughs> I mean, we have a lot to contend with here. It's like, there's a lot to live up to. And yeah. Yeah. like, I don't know, I feel like that romantic, you know, there, of course it's beautiful. I mean, we both know, even the Androscoggin's beautiful. If you look at it and you don't know, it's like industrial grade or that there's like fish that are really diseased or, <laughs> but if you look at it, it's really beautiful. Like that kind of, you know, trees hanging over the edge, like lacing the edges of the water, it's really beautiful. But but romanticizing it too much, I think Maine, it's, it's done a lot of, 
hurt to the state, at least for those more isolated pockets, it's like my town, you know, because, because if you think everything's okay, if you go to the coast and then you go home and you talk about all the fun things you did on your main vacation or your summer camp, then right. sort of ignoring what's happening inland. And if we're ignoring it, then you're ignoring it. Yeah. And nothing's going to improve. You know, I think a lot of people are surprised by this book. They're like, I didn't know there was such a main. I mean, you know it. I know it. But maybe a lot of people in Boston know it because they go there skiing, mm. <laughs> which yeah. I heard about. Um, yeah, that main, that myth main is really, it, it really drove me to in writing this book, people always talking about how it's such a beautiful place. And it's that same thing, like, yeah, but. Hmm. Can I bring up, I, I often think like the, um, there's so many ways to carry a book with you after you've read it, but sometimes just the thing I remember, there's always like a detail that gets yeah. a little shard of fiberglass or something that gets stuck in your arm, you know, and you just keep itching at it. And it was the, um, we just were driving across route two, you know, or across the river on route two, um, you know, from Rumford to, from the west side to the east side. And I was telling my wife about um, the part in your book, I think it's like in the first 150 pages, where you talk about the glossy paper that National Geographic um, printed their first editions on was that in some ways drove um, a, a, a very like peak period of industry for the Rumford Mill. Yeah, yeah. And how, and how we were sort of unpacking you know, like the, the um, how astounding that is that a magazine like National Geographic with its mission and the optics of that magazine, you know, and maybe less so now than in the sixties, um, came at the expense of, uh, of the consequence that the town paid and the river itself. Yeah. And that it, 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 I, I, first I should let you know, I tried to get in touch with them to see who prints their paper and what kind of print, what kind of paper hmm. they're done, but I think yeah. they have responses. Like over the past 10 years, I've emailed them a bunch of times. Oh, wow. Yeah, I would like, I don't know, I don't know how, maybe I'll just go knock at their door someday. But it also goes to that whole thing of like, you know, back then it was, even before that, you know, when photography was so important and they had to get their paper so white and so bright to make the photographs pop in a way that they were known for. And then to add it to that glossy stuff, which added a lot of extra chemicals on it. That, di that idea of whiteness too, you know, why, why it still has to be that way. I mean, I think we know more now, but if you just look around your office, everybody look around, I see white bleached products everywhere. You know, it's you know, tissues. Why are those white? I never understood. I mean, <laughs> tampons. I mean, I have a whole chapter about tampons if you haven't read the book, but um, just kind of questioning why are we doing this? Like you said, at the expense of, at the expense of such such trauma. And I, I should say this too, dioxins are, you know, the EPA and, and the media, they put dioxins to bed, like in the 90s, when the mill, when uh, mill bleaching processes changed that really um, reduced the amount of dioxins that were produced. And so everybody was like, oh, it's okay, I'm going to put it to bed. But even like the smallest amount of dioxins are like enormously dangerous right and that's that's and they like i said they stay in the system and they stay in the waters and they're in our dna they're in every single person's dna right now so much they just you know there's breastfeeding mothers feed their babies breast milk that's 77 times higher than recommended amount of dioxins so and then when wildfires occur not to bring it to that too but like that's when buildings burn, they're full of plastics and other chemicals and they're making lots of unmitigated dioxins. It's not good. Um, so they put that stuff to bed in the 90s. Nobody's really been talking about it, but I think it was a very strategic thing, thing that the EPA did, really. Mm. We just don't need to make things right mm. <laughs> like that. There's different ways to bleach it anyway, safely. Safe Can you talk a little bit about 
the relationship of your material to your family? Because I think, I mean, I was sort of, I think I said this, I was sort of surprised, eh, maybe not surprised, but um, when you take us on the journey back to France and we learn about, um, you know, your family origins to that degree of interrogation. Yeah. You know, I think a, a different book or a different writer or a different story, you could have said, well, you know, my family's Acadian and Carried you know, on. North. Yeah. That, you know, and then the, like the, a bunch of Franco Americans came into, you know, Maine during that time and the Acadians were my people. And that was that, but why, why did you feel like necessary? Why was it necessary to take such a deep dive? Cause I know I've done some of that work in myself and I, in my own family story and, and just have never found a satisfying answer, you know? Um, and that, I think, yeah. well, this is, uh, the book is a series of really untold or misinterpreted stories, you yeah. know? Yeah. Maine is one of them, which we already talked about. Um, I, I'll just rip through a couple more and then I'll get to the ancestors. But, you know, one is the story of working class New England, sort of the industrial backbone of America at one point. And, as told by a, a narrative nonfiction way, as told by a person within that working class. I yeah. really haven't read a book like that. You know, there's a lot of people helicoptering in, journalists and talking about stuff. So that was another thing, an untold story. There was also, I mean, there's all tons of untold things like in the American dream, we can get to that maybe, that's complicated, but that misinterpreted idea of the American dream, which I don't know if really existed. Um, and then my ancestors, you know, the Acadians and the French, the Franco-Americans was nothing I had read about. It, not only had I not read about it, but our town was comprised of like three quarters of the population was from this Acadian stock. And we didn't learn anything about it in school. And I only knew about it sort of in the ether of my family because it had long been sort of pressed out. You know, my grandmother in 1918 when she was born they they made french, speaking french in school illegal so she stopped speaking french when she was a kid um but i so i really wanted to understand you know we like i said our landscapes define us and i think that's a big part of the landscape of of who i am um and i wanted to understand that foundation but i had no idea about the history really like I mean, there's still more to learn. Mine, mine feels like so brief compared to what I know a lot of other people know about it, but I wanted to, you know, there's something else somebody said to me, I don't know if she's on this phone call, but um, the other, I was like, how can I really reach into the past? You know, how do you, how do you really feel a connection? And she said something so fascinating to me. She said, so I knew my great grandmother when I was little, I do remember her and I remember her telling a story and it's in the book and I have this just feeling about her. It was like not comprehensible. I was probably two or three when she died, but um, I remember her. And then, so if you look at, she was born 1886. She knew her great grandmother. So if you look at me knowing my great grandmother and then her knowing her great grandmother, we're going back like over 150, 60 years. So there's that, there's a, I don't know, it's a historical reach, you know, that there is a connection. I feel like there is that line, you know, there's, there's some kind of connection that she could give that to me. I, I felt that. I know that sounds crazy, but it's some kind of emotional, historical reach. Um, you know, I also wanted to understand what the ethnic cleansing of the Acadians um, I didn't understand anything about it really until I started researching it. You know, they were they were ethnically cleansed under at least the UN definition of the word from from their country, and it's no longer a country. There is no Acadia. Google it. It's not on a map. You know, where do you, how do you go home to a to a place, or how do you find your sort of homeland when it's gone? You know, I think there's a lot of course I, I can't call it my homeland I'm generations away from it but again to just understand because I do think that historical reach I also think there is something to like there's this Dutch study I look at about how certain genes can 
be affected by trauma. And no, you know, there's also the myths, myths within those myths, like Anne of Green Gables was the only thing I ever really knew about, right. about Acadia or Prince Edward Island, I should say, in this case. And Anne of Green Gables had nothing to do with the Acadians, really. Um, and in fact, that whole, some of that book is really racist. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Longfellow poem, Evangeline, you know, right. another one that was like sort of co-opted the Acadian history and then made it into this like love story when it was like a horror show it wasn't a love story you know I don't know I mean he does talk about that but Longfellow had never been to Prince Edward Island he didn't know anything he didn't know anything about it so it was like trying to dig through that history and not only for myself but I think for the Acadians themselves they are they've struggled with their story to be told and remembered because it just got wiped out so there's like, you know, I belong to all these groups of like genealogy. I was kind of did started doing genealogy in 2001. And I sort of feel a little bit of responsibility for that too. And like getting this Acadian story out into like the wider America. I don't, it's not really happening in this kind of form. You know, there's just history books and not in this form. Hmm. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, I think a lot about what that's making me think of in my own story is, um, you know, as a kid, really not having a, or having a narrative for the Vietnam War, which is the war for which yeah. I, can, you know, um, claim my existence, I suppose. Uh, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be me if not for the draft, you know. If not for a war, yeah. that's terrible. And that's, that's like, that's, you know, um, we all have our, our um, stories, but that recently has become uh, heavier in my life, you know, and, uh, and I think of all, there's this whole motif of um, from Platoon to Hamburger Hill to Full Metal Jacket to even Apocalypse Now um, yeah. to The Deer Hunter to all these movies that as a kid or as a young person, I remember watching with a great deal of like pathos, you know, and really feeling the, and I think the movies, um, bring you to a level of pain that um, is not inaccurate for some people, mm -hmm. you know, my father's generation, for instance, but then realizing that um, yeah, like the that. underside of that story is, in my case, my mother's story, you know, and, and I, I think the way that you trace, you know, I know it's, um, can feel sometimes far out for me to like claim epigenetic, you know, like this right. is. The, I mean, it, yeah, it feels a little kooky. I know. Yeah. But I, 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 it's, you know, as a writer, you, you have to go sleuthing around and I often can't think of a much better origin of, um, for my story, you know, what made me go out and do the kind of things I did for a long time than these historical forces, you know, and I, um, and, yeah, and you stitch together these stories of, of origins that are based on these historical forces. And they, I can't say that doing that, and I'd be interested to hear how this evolves for you over time. I can't say that doing that makes everything okay. And you're like, oh, now I just, you know, did a little genealogy work and um, read some different books and now I'm good, you know, but, uh, but it does in some ways build a foundation. And when there is no foundation, it's very, very difficult. You know, I know that I've been sitting on some um, steering committees for equity in my school system. And, uh, and you know, even just like ancestor stories that, you know, friends of mine who are African-American and they're like that, you know, the ancestor story is not an innocent story for mm -hmm. us to tell. And whereas some folks can say, oh, you know, the Mayflower or whatever, like it's, um, it becomes complicated very quickly, you know, and it's. It does. Yeah. You don't want to like sort of co-op the tr trauma of it. Like you say, you know, like, oh, I come from there, and therefore I am traumatized too. But it's, yeah. I think it's more of just an understanding, like you said, a foundation to just like understand where you come from. I mean, there is DNA, I mean, there literally is, and people are different based on DNA. <laughs> there is, there are things like that, but it's, it's more just like understanding where you come from and then what you choose to do with that, I guess, as a writer, 
Hmm. I don't know what I'm trying to say. Well, I think too, you know, Carrie, in your book, in a sort of in mine, like, so then you go to a landscape, you know, if you don't have the, the, the blood to trace, then you have to find a landscape to, to call your own in some ways. And then I go back to Prince Edward Island and I find that there were watermen. I think that was, they were fishermen, they were the men of water and they were, you know, here I am with the water again and they were building the dikes and like, reclaiming the land from the sea and then i go back to france so that was prince and then go back to france of like 16 1700s and they're doing the same thing so it's yeah. all in these rivers it's on the rivers in france i was like well that's weird and you know i mean i don't know the truth is stranger than fiction often i find you know connections like that and it and that made me feel some kind of connected. Then I could understand. So see, they, you know, these people are doing similar something to the water and then it's Prince Edward Island and here we are in my family, three generations of my family working in a paper mill on the water, using the water for industry. It's the same thing. So there is a, there is, that's passed down. And at least now I have an understanding like, okay, maybe ours is like a 20th century understanding, but I understand what Sort of yeah. what the 15th century or the 16th century people are doing, you know, right. right? That kind of understanding, at least for me, came through, and just to see what also drove them away. Yeah. What, what made them go, or what made them leave? In the case of Acadia, you know, the British basically get out, pow, pow. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna burn your house down. Um, so is there anything about your book that now that you've started talking about it a little bit that has surprised you? Like, do you feel like it's taken on meaning that's bigger than what you intended in any way now that you've had to frame it in, in new ways um, for readers? Yeah, well, I feel like it, you know, I started writing this book 10 years ago and it's just weird how many of the things feel so relevant to this current moment. <laughs> that's, what's, that's what surprises me really is, you know, I didn't know we'd be in such a toxic, disastrous climate changing mess. I mean, maybe I could have, if I was paying attention, I would have known other people knew, I certainly didn't. You know, I didn't know we'd be worried about, you know, people living in sacrifice zones and disenfranchised people based on environmental injustice. I didn't know that, didn't know there would be such migration of people all over the world. And, you know, it sort of, I, I felt touch points. You know, I was in Greece at one point a couple of years ago and seeing what was happening there with people, you know, taking boats to the water, to Greece. And I'm not saying this is any similar situation to ours, but I just felt like that kind of movement of people and it made me understand a movement of five people. And that, like you said, the sort of um, origin story, you know, people yeah. are just the, the sheer movement of people across the globe, you know. Um, but I think, and also the working class, you know, this was, this was probably the, a real primal part of the stories was the misunderstood about the work. I think it's a lot misunderstood and there certainly was in the last election politically. Mm -hmm. um, I think people were, working class people were put in little bowls of this is what they are and, and people, they didn't really see how a lot of these communities, especially like mine, I'm, I can only really talk for mine, but there are others, a lot of others, how they had suffered over the past 40, 50 years economically and identity wise, you know, if they don't have the paper mill, they don't have an identity a little bit. It's very tied together and so tied together. Right. So nobody really saw how frustrated they were. So when they, you know, our town, Mexico is the biggest flip from Obama to Trump in the state, Mexico, Maine was. Yeah, in the last time they were the biggest Obama voters and then they were the biggest Trump voters. So I didn't know that when I started writing the book, of course, I started the book in 2009 and that happened in 2016. So to be sort of tracking that, that's sort of the sort of 
rise, really the rise and collapse of the working class is what my book really covers in, you know, a lot of ways. I didn't know that we'd be coming into that moment of 2016 and then heading into it now when the book comes out. Mm. The same moment, like what's, you know, about working class. Yeah. So I'm just surprised. Yeah. Yeah. In general. Um, I, there's a great question in the chat. Ooh, okay. Um, from a brilliant writer named Charlotte Gross. I know her. She went to Breadloaf with me. Hi, Margaret. <laughs> I think that's her. Oh, Charlotte? Well, she must be using somebody else. I think that's Margaret. Oh, I think, it's, I think it's someone. I'm going to claim that person. I think I know Charlotte Gross. Oh, really? Maybe it's a different yeah. person. Okay, go. Okay, maybe her question will give her away. A question for both panelists. Uh, what did your notebooks, journals look like at the time you were living in the places you write about? in your respective books? Were you exploring the same kinds of questions then? Or were you only able to express the inner outer depths you reached now that you have years and distance in between? Okay, you can go first. No. Oh, geez, yeah. <laughs> um, wow. I like, uh, I like that, first of all, I like that you think I'm as organized as having a notebook, but thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have crates of notebooks <laughs> from that year that I wrote about. And I thought that I had a gold mine. I thought that I would open that crate and have enough material to write about forever. And it's oddly bland to read and not very illuminating of anything. And it allows me to keep a chronological record of things, which is kind of nice. I mean, yeah. I really do believe that you know, I, as much as people like to write memoir impressionistically, like I, I really can grant, you know, I, I'm kind of proud of the fact that a memoir that does not seem to need a uh, strict adherence to facts so much as impressions, you know, like of, of memory, but I can kind of claim, I can lock every date down in, and I put it there because it's sequential, you know, and because of notes and facts and archives and so forth. Um, so the notes were helpful for that reason. Um, you know, the things that I like to draw a lot and the things that speak to me more powerfully are the sketches that I made in the margins of my notebooks. Like they're so, it's just interesting how images carry marks and I don't know, tell a different kind of story than the, than the actual thought process. My thought process is really tedious and solipsistic and like in my own head and worried about my own life all the time. Yeah. Um, and there are some great little anecdotes along the road, but, um, yeah. Especially you were young. I mean, you were like 24 or three. Or 20, 23. Yeah. You were like a baby. I don't, so. yeah. yeah. I mean, right. those right. notebooks, I'd like to read that. That would be pretty funny. Um, yeah. no, never. Yeah. <laughs> that'd be something. Um, I have been, I actually think the beginning of my book is exactly, almost exactly how I wrote it <laughs> 10 years ago. Wow. I've been, I've been mulling over these same questions. And I think it started with this myth. Um, the myth of Maine is really what it started with because my husband was in the Coast Guard um, for 23 or four years, I always forget which. And we moved a lot and every place we moved, people would be like, oh, where are you from, Maine? And we'd have that whole conversation about like, well, I'm from the other Maine, you know, and trying to describe it to people. So I started writing about it. And then I would start writing about it and get really, you know, kind of, pissed off about I would just get well there's parts in the book I said I didn't even read anything but, um yeah so I really this idea of myth and then I realized how much it applied to so many aspects of things that I was discovering I mean the family thing I started I should say I started this this book with a the document that was wrong it was my grandfather's birth certificate and obituary it said he was born in this one town in, in Prince Edward Island, and then I come to find out, yeah, it wasn't the actual town. It's just a very small thing, but I was like, it started with a record that was wrong in history. And I, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I felt like, oh my God, what else is wrong? You know, and then it made me think of those mythologies and the, and the things, you know, even, even to, to Paul Bunyan, like we have one of those big Paul Bunyans in our town, you know, talk about a myth. Here's a guy, it's like deforested the woodlands, right? And then, we also have Ed Muskie, who is from our town, who penned the Clean Air and Water Act. And he has like a small little granite, looks like a grave 
stone. That's his memorial. I mean, there's Paul Bunyan, like, you know, yeah. I don't know. So I've been thinking about this for a long time. And in fact, I accidentally opened up my original manuscript just today and saw those notes. They were grossly underwritten, but, um, and not organized like you, mine were, yeah. mine was crazy. Yeah. I think that's why my structure is a bit crazy. Yeah. That's how my mind works. Right. <laughs> crazy. <laughs> um, I think we got maybe like, uh, it's 7:48. Is there any, like, what's our um, what's our big reveal here in our books? I mean, I yeah, I would say, no, no, you mm. should we tell them our future plans? No. Yeah. <laughs> you, are you? Yeah. I mean, that's always. I actually like that question. It's sort of edgy, you know. Like, what do you? Well, the R, me and you. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, let's do that. Yeah, that'll make us commit to doing it. Yeah. I'm going to say it publicly. My husband's like, oh, no, he's on this call. He's like, what are they doing? Yeah, <laughs> don't do it. Don't do it. That's bad publicity. Um, yeah, so why don't you tell your version? And then we'll I don't see know. It. No, you tell. <laughs> you right. go first, and I'll just say yes. Okay. I think I agreed to that. I'm not sure. So, so um, you know, everyone leads with, like, very strange times now, dot, dot, dot. But, um, <laughs> but uh, so my book, Rough House Friday, was chosen as the read main like a main humanities council uh summer read and pre-pandemic um i was supposed to connect with 70 public libraries across the state of maine and um and i was really excited i love driving around maine with my family and i was not making you commit to this by the way right and this is like right we're we're committed yeah it's okay Okay. i just want to tell you you're like oh no shoot yeah no if you start running your mouth like you're you're committed um (laughs) <laughs> and so I was really looking forward to seeing, hanging out in those public libraries. And some of them are in places that are not far from where you're from. Uh, I just spoke to a woman in Jay, Maine, um, and uh, another mill town uh, just south of um, Rumford, Mexico. And so we really want to connect with those libraries and not leave them behind because it's, it's I know what those communities are like and how important and how it is for me to connect with the kind of people that I grew up with, I guess. Totally same. You know, and I I don't know any like more delicate way to put it, but um, I miss that part of my background when I have found myself in like what we might call the literary world, you know? And so um, that would be really exciting. And I feel like we'll keep working on this, um, you know, the, the line that connects our stories because I think it'll get thicker and thicker as we go. Yeah, so my version of that story is I was like, I'm going to come with you (laughs) because 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 I uh, or virtually or whatever, because I, too, when I when this book was I planned on going to every little small town in Maine. I went to the libraries, to the VFWs, to the Eagles or whatever, because a lot of those towns like my town, they don't have bookstores or, you know, I just wanted to go and be there and just talk to not talk to people but actually listen to people is what i really wanted to do like sort of a listening tour i know that sounds corny but i really did and um and then this damn pandemic came along so i mean we can reach people in a different way and i really like these it's a different kind of intimacy i feel like Uh, and i really like them but but there's nothing like going to good old jay or winthrop maine and and talking to people at the library i can't yeah. I mean, to me, that sounds so exciting. <laughs> so I hope, we can, I hope we can do it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, everyone's invited. So. <laughs> cool. Um, and no, who's that? Carrie, I actually met you at the Orion workshop last year. Okay. Yes. I was thinking, well, a friend of mine, Margaret Gross, was supposed to be on this call, I thought. And I thought maybe that, oh, there's Margaret. There she is. Hey, Margaret. (laughs) She's there. She's coming to us from Australia. Cool. Yes. Awesome. I have a child knocking on my door. Um, Tomorrow is the second day of school, so I'm going to put my kids to bed. Um, Oh, they're coming in. (laughs) Breaking the door down. No, no. Yeah, oh, she's saying, yeah. I love it. So, um, well, That's thank you for too. hanging out. Oh, there she is. Oh, there she is. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you both uh, so much. I-
feel like I have to let Jed go say goodnight to his children. Uh, <laughs> thank you guys for being here. And thank you so much to um, the audience and uh, Charlotte for that amazing question. I was like on the edge of my seat. Like, yeah, I want to know about the notebook. Oh my goodness, that's so smart. I never think to ask things like that. Um, so yeah, I uh, dropped the links to both Rough House Friday and Milltown in the chat just in case um, anyone here hadn't already picked up a copy. Uh, so please feel free to uh, peruse while you are there. All of our other upcoming events, we do stuff like this almost every night. Um, and oh. yeah, we're uh, this this week was actually kind of one of the slower weeks. Um, but as soon as the pandemic hit, our amazing events director uh, was very on top of making sure a lot of those in-person events we already had scheduled could be converted virtually. So uh, we're so fortunate to get uh, to be able to to do things like this so often um, and so we're also so fortunate to have amazing authors like the two of you who are willing so now we have I have a new friend so <laughs> yeah awesome I know I love that story too I can't wait <laughs> to to see you guys in the main library so. we're, going, we're going on the road brother yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right well yeah right. I, I guess that's it thank from you. Us. um but thank you all so much and I hope everybody has a lovely evening Jim. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody.